everybody here today, and uh, good to see you. Um, it's a great, great, beautiful day outside today. I guess you all saw that it's sun shining. Isn't that amazing? After a few weeks of rain. So we're all ready to worship together today. We're so glad, and we'll be introducing, of course, later, is uh, Nance Thompson, and we're so glad to have him. And Let's see, we have Meredith and all the children here, and that's good, good to see y'all. I see Grandma's right in the middle there. That's good, that's good. Well, we'll introduce him uh, a little later. Uh, of course, then on our second song, we'll be taking up the offering. We'll just go right into that on uh, the second song here. But before we uh, uh, start today, we'll just open in prayer. And uh, then Andrew will uh, lead us in a couple songs here. That's great. Okay, Brother John, by the way, of course, is is uh, just enjoying a little time in Texas uh, with Sarah, and we're so glad that, that that could happen. And remember, tonight we do not have services tonight. Okay, so we will not have services tonight. So if you come here, just make sure the building's all secure. Look around, make sure nothing's going on. But there won't be any uh, services here tonight. Well, let's go to prayer now. Father, thank you for uh, just the privilege it is to meet together. Uh, thank you for your word. We pray now that uh, you would just be, uh, especially give uh, Yance uh, just a special measure of grace as he brings the word to us. Father, may we have ears to hear. Father, we think of those uh, among us that... Uh, uh, the prayer requests that we mentioned this morning, the prayers, we thank you for just this body. We uh, pray for those who are not with us because of sickness. And Father, we look to you, uh, to uh, your healing power there for those who are traveling for safety. And Lord, we thank you again uh, for today. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the privilege it is to meet together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this morning.
be here? Amen. Amen. You know, it's a story we talk about every week. But every time we approach the throne and every time we consider the cross, you should feel humble. Whenever you consider what Christ has done for you, you should stand in awe. Whenever you see yourself for who you really are, from a human standpoint, you should be ashamed. There's not one of us in here that's worthy to be where we are. But when we look at ourselves now, if we are in Him, we don't see what we have done unless we choose to. Because Christ says, I have covered it. I have taken your sin, I have put it as far as the east is from the west, and I look on it no more. It's not because he has lost the ability to forget, but he chooses to because why? He loves you. So any guilt that you have still, if you are in him, is only of your own self. He has redeemed you. He has taken it away. He has taken away all cause for fear and doubt. So as we approach the throne this morning, we stand beneath the cross and we gaze up and we consider it. Let's forget all that guilt. Let's forget all that that's in our hearts tonight or this morning. And let's simply say thank you, Lord, and let's praise him for it. Let's sing beneath the cross of Jesus. stand under your cross and consider you, we say praise be to your name. We are unworthy and yet we are called worthy because of what you have done for us. We love you. May all praise be given to you this morning as we continue in worship. In your son's name, amen. Thanks. You can be seated. Oh, you couldn't hear me? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Retired from being an auctioneer for a day and people can't hear me. That's not a good thing. All right. Uh, the R4G teen event. Don't forget that. That's going to be, uh, it will be at the three different churches. It will be Wednesday, June 13th. We'll be here at Tabernacle. The 14th at Grace Bible Church up in Mountain City. And then the 15th at Clayton Baptist. So please be inviting and encouraging the teenagers and, uh, in that area to come. And uh, so we can just have a, a great time uh, with that. VBS here will be, remember, keep these dates open. It will be July 8th through the 12th. It will be 6 at night through uh, 8.30 at night. Uh, and that's coming up uh, Sunday, July 8th through Thursday, July 12th. Keep uh, praying for uh, Andrew Brunson. 
Uh, he had another hearing, and it's still not, uh, uh, you know, he's just a political pawn. That's all he is, okay? He's a pure political pawn. Even the president has gotten in on this thing and uh, how wrong it is that in Turkey that he's in jail. But what they're trying to do is get some other guys out just for him. He is totally innocent, and uh, we need to be praying for him. He's a fine pastor, and uh, we pray that God would encourage him uh, as he's in jail there. All right. Now, uh, before, are we going to sing another song? Uh, All right. After some words from the words? What are these? Oh, okay. Wow, this is high tech stuff here, isn't it? <laughs> so how do I tell what's italicized on this little thing? <laughs> All right. Oh, there it is, it's on the big screen, okay. So uh, we will, uh, if it's italicized, remember we read it all together. If it's bold, then uh, I will read it and hopefully I'll get the cue on this thing. All right, here we go. Is this first italicized here? Okay, yeah, now all together. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not in temptation. And I tell you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? All right, very good. Um, now I guess we have one more song and I can introduce Yance, and then you'll sing. Good, all right. John told me all about this, but my short-term memory was like, yeah, okay, I can see I'm gonna have fun with this one. But I would like to certainly, uh, we are so glad to have uh, Yance here today. And uh, one of our former members, I did remember your <laughs> illustrations. <laughs> but Yance, we're just so glad to have you here today. And after this song, if you'll just come and present the word to us. Thanks. We can remain seated for this song. Let's sing together, All I Have Is Christ. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your
so all might see. The strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Amen? But Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose. And let my song forever be my only boast. appreciate that song a lot and hearing from that. Can I shut this down here? Um, I appreciate hearing that song before I get up here because that's really what we're going to talk about. But, you know, too many times we as Christians believe that our strength to do what the Lord commands us to do comes from ourselves, not from Him. So I really appreciate that song this morning. As we begin today, I will tell you, it is a delight for me and my family to be here. This is the church that, you know, as we started our life together that we came to and we were a part of. And we're just so blessed to be back. Some things have changed since we were here last, though. We have six children now. So they're all there and uh, some are in the nursery, two are in the nursery. And then the other thing, you have to forgive me, I'm getting a little bit older, so these glasses have got to go on so I can see to read. So... Some things have changed, but you know what? This hasn't changed, and the Word of God hasn't changed, and you know what? I am so blessed to be here today. I'm going to actually start a little different way this morning. Um, actually, the first time really I ever met uh, Pastor John here, we were going to T4G together, and uh, this book that I'm going to start with this morning is a book that when we went to T4G this year that we actually got. So we got this book here, and I'm going to actually start on an autobiography, reading this autobiography um, for you. Um, so it's going to take a second, but listen up. But s- there's some words here we may get into that, but th- th- we got that this this year at T4G. So just bear with me. Let me get there and get straightened up, and we'll begin. This morning we're going to be talking about prayer, the place of prayer, and. Um, this autobiography is on August, Augustine, and Augustine lived around 354, and he was a church father, a historian, a theologian. Um, he, he was a church founder, so he was a founder in the church. So just listen to this. This is what he wrote about his mother. He also wrote a book called The Confessions, if you know the Confessions, Confessing All His Sins. This church father was marred by lustful passions. That's not why I'm reading this today, but just know that that was the thing that was really hard in his life that he dealt with. So he wrote a book called The Confessions. This is a little excerpt from that book where he was confessing all this stuff, but he gives special attention to his mother in, this, in these passages, and it's about prayer. The remedy for him, God's side from this condition of coldness, of course, he's talking about the coldness of our hearts, is the gracious awakening of sovereign joy. But on the human side, it is prayer, and the display of God Himself as infinitely more desirable than all creations. And it is no coincidence that the prayers of Augustine's mother, Monica, pervaded the confessions. She pled for him when he would not plead for himself. Does that sound familiar in anybody's life? His mother's praying became the school where he learned deep things about Jesus' words. So mothers... Fathers out there, if you're listening, your kids are listening at all different times. He learned prayer when his mother was praying. Until now, this is John 16, 24, until now you have asked from nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. Monica had learned patience in the pain of long unanswered prayers. For example, her husband Patricius was unfaithful to her. But Augustine recalls in the confessions that Her patience was so great 
that infidelity never became a cause of quarreling among them. For she looked to you, this is Augustine saying, she looked to you to show him mercy, hoping that chastity would come through faith. So Jesus' words worked out in her life that the praying is the path to deepest joy. And what did she beg of you, my God, with all those tears, if not that you would prevent me from selling, but you did not but you did not do what she asked you. Instead, in the depths of your wisdom, you granted the wish that was closest to her heart. You did with me what she had always asked you to do. You rescued me. Later, just after his conversions, he went to tell his mother about what God had done in answering his prayers. This is a recalling of that. Then we went and told my mother of my conversion, who was overjoyed. And when we went on to describe how it all happened, she was jubilant with joy. You who are powerful enough and more powerful enough to carry out your purpose beyond all the hopes and dreams, for she saw that you had granted her far more than she used to ask in her tearful prayers. You converted me to yourself so that I no longer desired a wife or lustful passions or places, any hope in this world, but stood firmly on the rule of faith where you had showed me to her in dreams years before, and you turned her sadness into rejoicing, into joy far fuller than her deepest wish, far sweeter and more chaste than she had hoped to find in children begotten of my flesh. Such was the lessons Augustine learned from the unremitting travail of his mother's prayers. Not what she thought she wanted in the short term, but what she most deeply wanted in the long run. God gave her joy far fuller than her deepest wishes, Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be full. John sixteen twenty four. That is just a prayer of a mother, but prayer is important to us fathers as well. So let me say this quickly. Let me turn this around. to us men, and then I'll, this is just all introduction. We're going to be in Ephesians six. If you want to be turning there, Ephesians six ten through eighteen. But just as introduction, men, we sometimes think that prayer is not for us. We hear that women pray, and we see these prayer warriors. I can think of a lot. Um, Miss Lee is one of them that's here. Prayer warriors, we see women as prayer warriors, right? But men, we think that prayer is not for us, because we think that well, if we show that we need to pray, we're showing some kind of weakness, men. That is not the case at all. That is not what prayer. I, people, I do not pray that's weak. Men, that is exactly why we need to pray. Because we are weak and we can't do it. It is all Christ who has to do all these things. That's why I appreciate that song so much from the very beginning. So, just as introduction, we're going to be on prayer today. But if you're at Ephesians 6, 10 through 18... I'll read that for you. i got to tell you this real fast. I've lost some weight, and it's made me really dehydrated. So I'm going to be drinking a lot of water, so I apologize for that. Uh, let's read Ephesians 6. It says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against the world forces in the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedly and heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to, so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded up your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil, evil one, and taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. It is clear that the Bible teaches devotion to prayer. It teaches endless praying, and it commands us to pray. It even implores us to pray. But before we start today, I want to ask you one question, a simple question. Though prayer is so important, think about this for a second. Let me get your, think about this for a second. Though prayer is so important, do we live lives devoted to prayer? 
Does Jantz live a life devoted to prayer? Do you live lives devoted to prayer? We've talked, the Bible says over and over again, prayer is so important, but do we live lives devoted to prayer? Only praying in times of crisis is not being devoted to prayer. Only praying when you want something, that's not being devoted to prayer. That's not what we're talking about this morning. Do you want to live a life devoted to prayer? If those are the only times that you pray, if you only pray at meal times, that is not living a life devoted to prayer. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to. Matthew 6, 1 through 5 says this. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men, that you will be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues in the street, so that they will be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who knows what is done in secret will reward you. This is verse 5. When you pray, you are not to pray like the hypocrites, for they stand and they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Why is that so important? Men, that's not living a life devoted to prayer. We live in a day and age today where the more world is more concerned with public repentance than private repentance. Let me say that again. We live in a day today where we are more concerned with our public repentance. What does that mean? That means that I want the world to see me repenting. We live in a day where that's more important than it's than then what's really more important is my private repentance, that I'm broken before a God that created the heaven and the world, that, that I see my sin as sin against that, that I am just broken by it. How does this look? I mean, in 2018, how does this verse play out? Where private repent, or public repentance, that what those Pharisees were doing there, the hypocrites were doing there. What does it look like in 2018? Well, let me, t- let me tell you, this is how it looks. Facebook and Twitter. Now, I'm not against those things. I use them both, but this is what it looks like. Did you see what so-and-so did? I would never do that. Bless their heart, right? Facebook, Twitter. See, that's public repentance. That's, that is repentance based on political gain. That I, wanna, poli- I want people to know that I'm repenting so that they could... Oh, Yance is a good man. That's what I mean by public repentance rather than private repentance, as me seeing God for who He is. This is not the kind of repentance that, that we want. God, thank you that I'm not like that tax collector guy. The problem t- today is we're just like the Pharisees. It plays out like this with prayer. This is how it plays, plays out with prayer. Someone makes a comment on Facebook about a difficult situation that they're going through. If you're not praying... That's called a lie. This is what the verse 6 says in Matthew 6, 5 there. But you, when you pray, go to your inner room. Close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Prayer is important. If you want to guard yourself from being like the Pharisees or living a life like the Pharisees, if we want to guard ourselves from that, and I'm telling you, I know we do, we better learn how to pray. Now, it's hard to pray. But why is it so hard to be devoted to praying? Why is that so difficult for us? Why is that so difficult for me? Why is it difficult for us to be, live lives that are devoted to prayer? Well, let me just give you a couple that I, that I go through. Time. It seems like I don't have time to pray. That could be a cause for us not praying, if we're honest. Time. But do you know what? If your day is twice as hard, you need to spend twice the amount of time in prayer, or you're not going to get anything done, so time can't be a factor. You need twice as much time in prayer if you find yourself twice as busy. 
Here's a big one, though. Is it, be, is it hard to pray because we don't have a relationship? Maybe we don't have a relationship with the person that we're praying to. That would make it awful difficult to pray if you don't have a relationship with God that you're praying to. That's a big one. We might get back there. But could it be, I'm going to give you an easier one. Could it be that we don't really understand why we should be devoted to praying without ceasing? Could that be the reason that we find it so hard to pray is because we really don't understand the why to pray. We're given the command to pray, but we don't really understand the why to pray. Could that be why it's so difficult for some of us to pray or for me to pray or when I find myself in bad situations where the first thing I don't do is just fall on my knees in prayer? Could that be? If you're taking notes today, and I hope you are, I'm going to make this really practical. I hope. And here's what I want you to do. At the top, put pray at all times. You have a little piece of paper. You can put pray at all times. On this side, put why. One, two, three points. And on this side, put how. Five points. Because we're going to do really practical. We're going to do a really practical why and how to pray. How many of you out there are parents? Raise your hand. I got I got them. Okay? Kids are always acquiring great questions and why questions, right? If you have kids, you know that kids like to ask why, 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 why. That's why we're talking about the why to pray. Sometimes they're great questions for understanding, but you know what? When, when we're adults, we get really kind of frustrated about those why questions sometimes, if we're honest, don't we? Like, just want to backhand one every once in a while. Right? Why, Dad? I, I don't know. Why? But listen, they're asking why. That is a great question. Look, the Bible says to pray. You should ask why. It's going to tell us. That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we get in there, let me just give you some of those questions my kids have asked me that have put me on itch. All right? These are funny, so you can laugh. Okay? They're sitting right there. These are some of the questions that they have asked me, those crazy questions that have kind of put me on itch. Dad, do motorcycles have air conditioning? This is the second one. What is the name of the space between the bits that stick out of on a comb? <laughs> have you ever thought about that? They have. Why? Because I said so. Say your prayers. Why? Because I said so. Talk to God. Why? Because the Bible says so. I'm not against saying those things, but guys, if we're not teaching why these things are so important, we're missing the boat. I have quit teaching my kids this prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. You probably know it. I pray the Lord my soul to... And if I die before I... I pray the Lord my soul to... Yeah, I've quit teaching my kids that one. Number one, it's it's frightening to teach a little kid that prayer. First of all, right? My soul? They keep it while I'm sleeping? So really, I re- really why I've quit teaching them to pray like that because I am not helping them learn to pray. I'm just giving them a, a nursery rhyme to recite. Here's the other nursery rhymes that we teach. Maybe you know these. Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of... Jack fell down and broke his... And Jill came tumbling after. That's scary too, right? Jack has broken his head. Those are scary things to teach kids. But that's what we're associating prayer with. Why pray? Pray like this. Here's another one. rock a baby in the treetop. When the bow or quakes or the cradle will rock. But when the bow breaks, the cradle will, and down will come baby, cradle and all. What are we teaching? The kid has fallen out of a tree. But... But we go through life praying this exact same way. We don't really understand why we should do it. We don't, and when we become adults, we don't ask that why question anymore because it's not acceptable anymore to ask the why question. 
there's a lot at stake, and let me get to my points here. There's a lot of stakes. Ephesians 6 says, put on the full armor of God and do that with all prayer. So we've just put on the armor of God, and prayer is a part, just like that sword of faith, that shield, just like those things, prayer is a weapon. With all prayer, that's why he says it's so important. Prayer is the focus today because prayer is a part of the armor of God. But we must understand the why behind prayer. Yes, it is a command. And you should do what you command. The Bible says to pray and you should pray. But there are some more reasons why we should pray more than just because we're told to. So I'm going to tell you those three. You, are you keeping notes? Why? Number one, point number one, life is war. Why should you pray? Life is war. Let me tell you. Let me say. I think we could all agree that life is a struggle. And life is a war. And there are some of us now in here today that are literally hanging on by our nails and fighting with life. Because life is a struggle. If you want to come through that, we better learn how to pray. Understand that the curse has made us toil, work with our hands, childbirth, poverty, sickness, illness, and death. But the most devastating aspect about the curse is not just death, but separation from God. Because of sin, life is war because we're separated from our Creator. And listen, it's not people that we're fighting against. Let me make sure that that's very clear. It's not people we're fighting against. See, that's why that Ephesians passage is so important. Look back against who are we at war with? Against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces and darkness, against spiritual forces and wicked and heavenly places. They are seeking to do you harm. But it's not only these principalities that we're at war with. We are at war against sin in our own self and in our own heart. You should wage war in sin with sin. Why should we pray? So carried a spear. Do you know why they carried a spear? When you're looking here, you might not can see the spear, but I think it's here. Conjecture says that it's here. They, well, Roman soldiers carried a spear because of this. They were the first to, to invent the cleats. So whenever they st- stood in battle and they could stand still and they were getting pushed back, their cleats would make them not go backwards. One reason that they carried a spear was because when they dug in, they would stick that spear in the ground and they would lean against that spear. So not only did they have their shoes, their feet shod with cleats, they had that spear behind them, so when the people pushed back against them, they had a stop so they, they, could, they couldn't be pushed back. That was one reason. The other reason that they carried the spear was because, why? if that horse is riding at you, right, you can take that spear and just fling it right out, dismount that horse. That's what prayer is, an offensive weapon. That's what, that's what he's saying here. In Ephesians, with all prayer, when all that sin and all those things are coming at you, you have something to fight against those things with. That's what Ephesians, that's the picture Ephesians 6 is trying to, with all prayer. Prayer is important because life is war. That was a Roman soldier. Let me give you a, let me give you a modern example of this. Maybe some of you like war things like me. We play stuff at our house all the time. When you think about prayer in a modern day, think about this. Have you seen those new, the new technology that we have where we can take um, heat-seeking missiles and laser point them, guide them in by laser targets? So if we wanted to take on a place, we could laser point it, and that missile would take flight and hit that target, right? Heat-seeking missiles. You got the picture? Think about prayer as that, where you can shine light on something, pinpoint that sin in your life or my life or that thing that is coming at you. You can pinpoint it, and then the Lord will take care of it. That is what prayer is for. Let me tell you this story. John R. Fox was a member of the 92nd Infantry Division in World War II. 
Lieutenant Fox was part of a Ford observation team. These are the guys that get close behind the enemy lines to call down artillery fire from enemy positions. So basically what he did was he had his walkie-talkie. And I want you to think about prayer this way. A walkie-talkie. That he's calling down enemy fire from, below, from down. Think This is what this fox guy is doing. He's back there saying, hey, that's where they are. That's where they are. That's where they are. Hit them. So you know what he does? Now, on December 22nd, 1944, an Italian village in America forced to retreat after they had been overrun by the Germans. So the Americans were forced to get out. From Lieutenant Fox's hidden position in a second-story house, he directed American defenses fire. So he's saying, they're coming at us. That's where they are. I'm giving you my coordinates. The Germans greatly outnumbered the Americans. Fox radioed for the artillery to slow the Germans' advances, but there were just too many... The first volley slowed the Germans, but the advance wasn't enough. Fox called another barrage and hit closer to the house. Still, the Germans came, and they were coming closer and closer. Finally, Fox ordered the house itself to be targeted, the house that he was in. The Germans had come close, and he's calling down the fire. Fox is in in the house, and he said, Bomb the house that I'm in. Fox called... And they, uh, th- it was the only way to give the Americans time to retreat and regroup. The soldier who received the order protested Fox, radio back. He said, fire it. They did, and they didn't hear from Fox again. The U.S. forces were able to regroup, counterattack, and take the village back from the Germans. When they entered the village, they found the house to show what needs to happen to us sometimes, though. Sin has crept closer and closer and has overtaken our hearts in such a way that the only way to get rid of of the sin, is to bomb. Lord, take this away from me. The flesh man has to die. I hope you catch that picture there. Sin is often creeping closer to us. This is the second reason to pray. If you're taking notes, prayer makes us humble ourselves to the sovereignty of God. By praying, you say, God, I can't do it. That's what we're talking about at the very beginning, men. I'm saying, I cannot take care of this situation. I cannot help in this situation. Prayer is humbly asking. I am a man. I hate asking people to help me. That's pride. When we pray, we're being humbled to our pride. It's God's ability. Let me just, Exodus 15, 6 says, Lord, your right hand, O Lord, is majestic power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound in you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. So if you're taking notes, first, life is war. Second, prayer makes us humble. And here's the third, God acts when we pray. God acts when we pray. Listen, this, don't overlook this. I cannot tell you the countless times that I've seen this. Something, sometimes a breakthrough has come when I prayed. When I thought I was too busy to pray because of my long day, but when I forced myself to pray, ideas that I've had through that prayer have saved me hours and hours and hours of work. God acts when His people pray. When I have f- find that I have twice as much work in a day, I must spend twice the amount of time in prayer. Now, let's move over to the other side quickly. We've talked about the why. Why do we pray? Why do we pray? Why do we pray? I hope I've given you three really good reasons to answer that question. If anybody asks you, why do you pray? Just like you would answer a child if they're asking a good question, why? But we're going to move over to some practical applications because if you understand the why and you don't know the how, It's not going to do you any good. So let's talk about how do we pray. So if you're taking notes on the other side, one through five, how do you pray? First, you play structured and unstructured. Both ways are extremely important. Both ways are extremely important, structured and unstructured. You know what I mean by structured and unstructured? By unstructured, I mean just pray free. This is pouring yourself out to God. 
This is having, <laughs> this is just going to the Lord unstructured, right? And just crying out, pouring. Both are extremely important. But unstructured is so important because it's just, it's just that intimate time. That's why it's so important. Just be overwhelmed by need and just freely asking. It's not scripted. Without this, I doubt there is any relationship with Christ at all. If you do not have unstructured prayer in your life, if, if prayer is just coming, just something that you structure all the time, I, I don't know that you have a relationship. Because when I see my wife and I have a relationship with her, yeah, there are times that we set some specific times. But sometimes we just talk about anything we want because we just have a relationship, right? That's, that is a sign that you have a relationship. If you're just in the car saying, Lord, I need help. Lord, this is going on. That's what a relationship is called. But let me call the other side. It's called structured prayer. What does that look like? What does structured prayer look like? Does anybody here have a structured prayer life? Let me give you some examples. You know what the commands of the Bible are? What is the command that the Bible says? Does anyone know? Yeah. Lord, you have commanded me to love you. Lord, help me love you. You have commanded me to love my neighbors. Help me to love my neighbors. You can pray those commands that God has specifically given you in the Bible. Pray the commands of the Bible. You can also pray the promises of the Bible. Lord, you've promised to never leave me or forsaken me. That's a promise your word has given me. Open the Bible in front of you. Put one elbow on one side and one on one elbow on the other side of the Bible and just put your hand and just read the scripture and just pray the scripture as you're reading it. That's a prayer. You want to come intimate with God. This is a structured form of prayer. Unstructured is, is important, but this is structured. You can also pray list. There is one here that, that there is one here. I think y'all still have the prayer list. Yeah, there's a prayer list that goes every day. These are lists. You can pray those lists. They say, that's easy form of structured prayer is the list that you're given here. Pray that every day. Right? You must have lists. Let me just put in your head. You, you got lists, but you must put lists to the paper. Keep some kind of prayer folder or notebook because if you don't, well, you're saying you're, you, all, those, all those prayers that somebody's given, we, we can't remember all those. That's why a list is so important. If you can remember all the lists that everybody gives you, you're God. That's what He does. He can remember them without a list. Me and you cannot. Also, there's books like Operation World. All those kind of, you can pray for a different country every week. There's all kinds of different places um, you can pick them up. There's devotional gods that give you all these places. that you. There's books all over you can pray. But here's another one. Patterns. Develop a pattern of prayer that gives you some guidance. Have, has anybody heard about the concentric circle prayer? When I say prayer, concentric circles. Where's the, where's the, where's, you start with yourself first and then pray out. So, Lord, pray, I'm a sinner. I need you above all. This is a pattern of prayer that you can pray every day. And then pray that the Lord will guide you. And then going out to my wife, to my children, to my family, to my church family, to Raven County. See the concentric circles? Every little pattern. Pattern of prayer. You can pray those patterns. Here's the second one. The second... Uh, so structured and unstructured. You can also pray alone and assembled. Being devoted to prayer means that you will regularly pray alone and regularly play assembled with other Christians. There is no Christianity without a personal trust in a, in, and communion with God through Jesus. All is, sh all is show and presentation without this. What does that mean? Prayer is, is important to have that intimate. If you're, not, if you're not doing it because you have a relationship with God, you're doing it because you want other people. And that's a show. That's what Pharisees do. So alone and assembled. Listen to this. Susan Wesley. You know, I, I like stories, so here's another one. Susan Wesley 
with her 16 children, way more than I have, 10 more, used to pull her apron over her head in the kitchen, okay? And when she, when Susan Wesley would pull her apron over her, in, in the kitchen, that means the children needed to go. That was her, but she would pray during that time. Listen, the children had learned that this meant silence in the kitchen. Children need to learn that mommy and daddy have times with Jesus. Doing that in your small group? Do you have small groups? Is your small group regularly praying together? Your Sunday school group? There's opportunities to pray everywhere. I'm sure there's a lot here, but find those opportunities and seek them out. Here's the third one, how to pray. Pray desperate and delighted. I won't spend much time here, but I will tell you that this is an important one. Are you praying when you are most critically needing help from the Lord? And are you praying when you're delighted? Those are both times to pray. If you're just praying when you're, Lord, I need your help through this. I cannot do it. And you're not praying in the delighted times. You know, everybody, you remember when uh, they were in prison there and they were praying in the prison? The Paul, they were praying in the prison. Everybody says, Paul and Silas, they were in jail, right? Remember that? They're praying. And everybody goes, man, they're praying in jail. Look, I find it easier to pray when I am going through a time of jail or struggle where I need. You know when the time is hard to pray? When everything is going great. That's when I forget to pray. So you have to pray when you're desperate and when you're delighted. This is uh, the fourth one, short and long. By short and long, I'm talking just about length. All I mean here is are you saying short prayers like, Lord, help me. Lord, I need you. But you're not hanging up the walkie-talkie. You're not hanging up the telephone line. See, we think of prayer as a, uh, as a, a household telephone. Lord, I need this. Thank you. But it's a walkie-talkie. That, that communication never grow, never depart. You always have communion with the general. So short and long. Are you taking time to pray long periods of time? Like I'm talking about days. Have you scheduled in 2018 a day or two where you're saying, I'm just going to go out to wherever, and I'm just going to pray for the day. Yes, it's going to be hard, and yes, it's going to be difficult, but... We need that. We need short prayers and we need long prayers. Here's the other, here's the final way to pray. Spontaneous and scheduled. Spontaneous and scheduled. All I mean here is when. Is when are you praying? By spontaneous and scheduled, I mean. If we are to be devoted to pray, to prayer. We will pray sp- spontaneously throughout the day because that it never the, you never hang up the phone without ceasing. That's what we talked about. Pray without ceasing, as Paul says, a consistent spirit of communion with Christ, walking by the Spirit and knowing Him in continual co- personal presence in your life. That He is always there. That you're not hanging up that communication line with Him. That's spontaneous and scheduled. No plan will govern when you speak to Him. That you don't have to have a plan. He's not, you don't have to have a plan when you're going to talk to him. You just spontaneously, he's a good father. Have you heard that song? He, you're a good, good father. He's a good father. He's not, he's not going to give you, what's the scripture we read? He's not going to give you a stone when you ask for a fish. He's a good father. You can come to him spontaneously. You need him. That's spontaneous, scheduled. It's like a marriage. I used to do good spontaneous stuff. My wife says that all the time. You used to be so spontaneous. We used to date and all. And you just, right? But when you have kids, the spontaneity, the spontaneity leaves. And that's bad. But listen, that's why you also have to have scheduled time. When I have kids in my relationship with her, we can no longer just go out on Friday night at 11 o'clock and jump off Burton Bridge. We can't do that anymore. We have to have scheduled time. We have to say, kids, go to your room, and we're going we're gonna to have our time together. But that's what I mean with scheduled. Are you scheduling a time with God where none of the answers, but I forget to read this one? Are, into the, how long are you going to set aside to just simply reading your Bible 
and turning it into all prayer. That's what we need for 2018. We need to quit teaching people prayers. And I'm closing with this. We need to quit teaching prayers. Remember, now I lay me down to sleep. Lord, thank you for the food. We need to quit teaching prayers. We must learn how to pray. Sometimes we as adults have memorized a prayer, especially over food, saying to God, here's my prayer, here's my pre-written note. But if we just did that with our relationships with one another, what kind of relationship would that be? And then we expect to have this relationship with him that he does everything for us, but we just throw these pre-written notes up to him all the time. I mean, let me ask you a question. We all like to get cards, but if there's nothing handwritten in a card, I mean, it doesn't make you feel special. Everybody's gotten that one. Prayer is communicating with God. It is possible, listen to this, it is possible for you to offer prayers that are not heard in heaven. It is possible for you to offer prayers that aren't heard in heaven. They don't even get out of the building. Have you ever felt that way, that you're praying, and that I'm just praying they haven't even left the church? They haven't even left the car that I'm in. Matthew 15, 18 says, These people offer me honor with their lips, but they are far away from me. Learning how to pray is so important. We, do you want to be close with the Father, with the Creator? Prayer is just a conversation with God. In the good times, through the bad times, decade after decade. It's a conversation. It's a continual conversation that goes like this. Lord, I need you. And you just continue to walk year in and year out. Lord, thank you. And you, you develop this relationship with him. And here I know it's going to get a little more, but, but this is what it looks like because it prayer is just conversation that one day we will leave this world and die but that conversation with the Lord just keeps going on through eternity. That when you get to heaven as a Christian and you pass over to the other side and the Lord meets you, you will know who He is because you have that relationship with Him. That's what continual prayer looks like in the life of a Christian. I can't tell you enough how thankful I am that God gave you that message this morning, and I think this church needed it. There is so much that uh, we've been given that we do not seek Him to thank Him for, that we do not see Him being the purpose of. And I think we need to take some time here at the end of this service I know some of you may have plans to get to, and if you have to get out, that's fine. But I want us to take just... just
where sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in me Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, sing it if you know it, Lord, I need Lord, I... 